Hi again, YouTube. It's Valerie Reified, which you probably, again, would know if you were looking at the page or the top right corner or, you know, came here after checking out other videos. Anyway, that's fine. Um, today I want to talk about some questions of problematic language, and I want to talk about specifically um, the great transsexual transgender divide, which seems to be once again tearing the community in, well I won't say twain because there's way more than two, um, two tendencies there, and also um, the rhetoric of innate compulsion versus personal choice. Um, I think I'm going to start with the trend, uh, transness first. Because uh, it will, it will, tra uh, if you'll forgive the clunky and redundant language, transition nicely um, into the second point I want to make. Um, you see it, especially on the blogosphere, um, but also on YouTube, there seems to be people in the trans community, um, especially the trans feminine spectrum, who want to separate between what they'll call, um, well, everyone's got their own little nomenclature. I mean, you have people like Jasper, who I believe is now going under the name Straight Queer, I think probably always was going under that name. I have responded to uh, one of his, that is now his preferred pronoun, so I'm using it, one of his um, videos. Uh, and he has previously, and I think maybe the language is getting a bit less busted, but it's been a point that's been brought up a lot of times, especially, um, interestingly enough, by a lot of, you know, cis men who hang out near women's studies majors, you know, not, not to make too many assertions, um, that choosing not to transition is somehow more uh, authentic um, than choosing to transition if you believe you're feminine, and thus, you know, also putting yourself in box male, but saying, oh, you can be a femboy. Well, there are femboys. Um, there are, there are feminine men, there are masculine women, but that doesn't mean that one is necessarily trans if one is more, is, is either more feminine or masculine than one's gender prescribes. Uh, that's some good coffee. Anyway, um, and then you see on the other other end, there's a lot of there's an ugly strain of post-operative supremacism as well. Um, say you know people who are very very angry about being lumped in with uh, with what they will say is the transgender umbrella. They'll, um, most frequently identify as women of transsexual history. And that's a very clunky way of saying trans women, but you know that's me. Um, and saying that they've gone through the whole very, very regimented standards of care, real life, if test. Most frequently they will say also that it is important to be heterosexual. So basically it's, it's sort of like the, the last angry defenders of the uh, 1979 standards of care. And they want a very clear dividing line between who is a woman and who isn't a woman. And, well, frankly, I find it just flat insulting. But then again, so did I find, so do I find the subversivist rhetoric insulting. There is an umbrella. It exists. Anyone who needs access to the means of gender presentation um, in a way that is at odds with their birth assignment, even if that's, you know, gender fuck as simple as, as wearing, you know, two earrings or lipstick in public or what have you, uh, through electrolysis, hormone replacement therapy, surgery, they're all connected and there is perhaps not exactly uh, exactly the same opprobrium but there is a spectrum of cis opprobrium. opprobrium. Um, you are expected to be a good little whatever the doctor who slapped your butt says you were um, and to not and to not transgress those norms 
And it doesn't matter if you pass for cis now. It really doesn't. You still had to fight doctors. You may have developed some sort of uh, identification with your oppressor, but you still had to go and jump through their hoops and you weren't seen as valid until you, you know, f fulfilled every single letter on down. And yeah, now that perhaps you situated yourself in such a way that you're okay, that doesn't mean that everyone else isn't. Um, and so let's stop with you know, let, let's stop with transgender and transsexual and just, and transvestite or whatever else. Let's just go with trans. Because it is a broad spectrum. It is a large number of people who want to not be fired, not to be denied housing, not to be, uh, not to have their presentation called into question or their gender called into question. Simple, s simple respect of authenticity. Um, and we are all fighting for that. Um, whether, whether or not some of us manage to minimize that um, and whether some of us manage to um, avoid, uh, avoid conflict and that does, does not make us more authentic. Um, everyone who is transgressing, uh, transgressing not just gender norms but you know presenting in ways that are very deliberately um, not our assigned gender is on the trans spectrum, you know, um, by virtue of, by virtue, by virtue of my, of my request for HRT, I outed myself as trans. It didn't matter that I, you know, hadn't changed my presentation in any way, shape, or form. Doctors knew it, and they treated me horribly and accordingly. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting. I had, as I mentioned in an earlier video, um, when I went to a general practitioner to get spironolactone, I had a blood pressure of 155 over 95, which is, for those of you who don't know, high. And spironolactone is, for those of you don't, who don't know, actually a blood pressure reduction drug. Um, that was its initial purpose, but it was found to be a pretty potent antiandrogen at the same time. So, yeah, um, and I still waited five months. I waited five months while I was borderline hypertensive for a hypertension drug because it would help me to present as female. So if that isn't cis-axism, I mean, I don't know what else to say. I don't, you know, um, I hate the language, but, you know, most accurately, I, most frequently, I mean, I don't get gendered as male. I may dress butch, I may, you know, wear sweatshirts and t-shirts and and sweatpants because, you know, that's what someone who's my height can buy for ten bucks a piece. Um, but, yeah, me and pass. Um, and that's not a, you know, that's not a good thing, that's not a slur against anyone who doesn't, it's just saying that there is a definite difference between, uh, just as much as there's a definite difference between being red male and being red female, there's a definite, definite difference between being read as, uh, as transgressing cis norms. Um, and they're not norms that every cis person holds, but they're just norms that are assumed and generally beneficial to most cis people. Um, I don't want to get into discussions of privilege because that sort of denies a, an awful lot of experience. Like, for example, the woman in uh, northern Ontario who was fired from her serving job because she shaved her head for camp, uh, to raise money for cancer research. Um, I don't think a male server who shaved his head would get, would have gotten fired. Anyway, um, so there's that. There's, you know, we need to stop trying to divide, uh, trying to section and divide ourselves um, and start recognizing that we have an awful lot in common. Those of us who identify as a gender separate from their birth gender need to have legal recognition of that or we need to end the situation where public and private recognition of gender is a determinant of socioeconomic status. Um, yeah, it's, it's like marriage, you know, either, either legalize it for everyone or eliminate it for everyone. Um, as long as there's equal treatment under the law, that should be the first, first level of importance. Um, and yes, um, you know, I, the, to the HBSers and the WBTs out there, 
there's a lot of people who need access to transition medicine, and most of them will identify as a gender opposite from that which they were assigned at birth. Um, it's really limiting just because you were, you know, um, Ray Blanchard's wet dream of, you know, the perfect, true transsexual, um, that no one else be allowed to transition. In fact, it's interesting, as I noted in my last video, um, on one of the reasons that the incidence of transition is rising dramatically, the standards of care have been relaxed. Access to transition medicine is demonstrably easier than it was 20 years ago. And has the regret rate increased? No, no, there's a lot more satisfied customers out there. Um, among other things, because it's less and less likely to end someone's uh, professional and personal life if they're out in trends. It's, you know, I was out at work, one person said something snarky, um, one other, one customer said something snarky, and that was pretty much it. Oh, and the person who said something snarky pretty much got his ass handed to him within minutes. So, yeah, um, people are much more supportive. Um, there are not so supportive people, but there are very supportive people. And now I wanted to move into um, something that I've seen cropping up recently, um, and it got me thinking. There was a uh, reply by, I believe it was Senate ne Nectar to, uh, Nuke, uh, to Nuke on how she'd just gotten out of some um, radical feminist conference where it was asserted that women could choose to be lesbians, which, hey, you know, I'm fully in favor of, you know, every woman being a lesbian, but I kind of understand it's not really practical, practicable for everyone. But, yes, presentation of sexuality is to some extent a choice. Uh, that doesn't make it less valid. I mean, you know, you look at the you look at the 1950s, the 1940s, and 1960s, and a lot more people, they didn't cho choose to be attractive, but they chose to attempt to live their lives in, in a heteronormative way. Um, that's different from what we, we may um, prefer. Uh, I think the real problem I have is the implication that whether one chooses to um, live life according to their desires or, or social opprobrium, we decide which one is more authentic. Um, you know, there are, if, if you want to take the example, um, you, look at, you look at the rate of social transition in Thailand and you assume, for example, that at least one in 167, maybe let's say generously one in 200 women are trans. That would have to be a bare minimum because that's the number of people transitioning in another climate where, you know, they're, they're not, all the mothers aren't taking DES in maternity, as nice as that would be. Uh, so there's, there's no real biological driver of an increased incidence of transness. There's just less social opprobrium um, against transitioning. So why do more of them, why do more Thai women uh, choose to transition and less North American and other Western women choose to transition? We have a slightly lower incidence of social transition. Uh, insurance companies are putting it at about one in eight hundred and sixty-seven. I tend to think it's a little bit lower, but you know, insurance companies are very good at uh, at setting metrics, which then they have to have their managers meet. Um, but yeah, there's there's still a significant difference between the rate of transition here and the rate of transition in in Southeast Asia, um, especially yeah, in Thailand and other countries. Um, and the reason has to be, uh, to a great deal, it's, it's the sexism. It's people have made choices which they think are more functional. Um, I don't, you know, I, um, I can't tell someone who's non-transitioning that the only way they'll be happy is, is that they transition. It's an amount of social stress that varies from person to person, and each person can decide how to, um, how to treat that. And it's not, you know, I will be respectful, I'll use the pronouns they choose to have used, but I won't 
pre- I, I won't say that their decision is more authentic or less authentic. I'll say it didn't work for me. Um, I tried it, and it damn near broke me in two. But good thing to learn is our experience isn't everyone else's experience. You know, I mean, people have compulsions. Um, compulsions that a lot of people find strange because, well, you know, you didn't have that toolkit at birth. It doesn't happen by doing nothing. Therefore, it must be wrong. It's interesting, though. I mean, you know, one could say, one, one could, uh, as some oh-so-kind uh, commenters have have noted my uh, my body type, you know, one could say that being overweight is a choice. I mean, you know, I could make a daily effort, for example, to uh, to eschew the the calories and and stick with more salad and fruit, and I try. Um, I guarantee you, you find me a fat person who hasn't tried, uh, who hasn't tried healthy amounts of calorie restriction and exercise, and I have a bridge to sell you. Um, yeah, that's. But it's interesting. Um, certain kinds of choice we allow for, um, because one, there does tend to be biological inclination that drives that choice. Um, and two, you know, there's also a point where we decide, look, you know, a person's a person and what they do to themselves is mostly their business. I mean, we don't state that there's an innate, uh, we don't state that there's an innate biological reason for a woman to abort a pregnancy in most cases. I mean, we abandoned that standard, which was good. It was a fantastic step forward for women, mostly cis women and some trans men and I don't know of a probably a very small amount of intersex trans women, but I digress. Um, you know, it's a choice. You know, hence the phrase pro-choice. Why does something so, in, um, something so integral to one's uh, body be, need to be a choice there for cis women, for you know cis normative women, and then for sexuality it has to be innate. For other means of gender presentation it needs to be innate. For people in other communities, you know, um, the transhumanist types, why does that need to be innate? Why does it need to be compared to bodily integrity disorder? And for exact that exa- for that matter, why does that need to be innate? Um, you know, the rallying cry used to be my body, my choice, but it turns out that the only people who seem to want choice are people who are already considered fairly normal. Um, and I hate to break it to you, there is no normal.